Hello everyone and welcome to Mather Days. Alrighty, um, my name is Teresa Wills. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at George Mason University in the Mathematics Education Leadership Department. And this is my favorite part of the week, um, being here with all of you to talk about mathematics and um, also um, kind of look at different ways of implementing it online. I've been teaching online now for a decade, and specifically in the last six years, I've been using Google Slides to um, figure out how we give students more interaction, collaboration, and voice um, as we increase their agency in uh, classroom and, and uh, have them be participants, um, but be even more than that and being owners of their um, learning. So I'm here today to share a couple strategies with you all. Um, you're going to be working within two windows today, um, and uh, so let's get you the link. Here is the link in the chat box for our slides, and I'm going to stop projecting mine. Testing, testing. Hello, everyone. All right, looks like I'm back up and running. Alrighty, so um, minus some tech glitches, uh, thank you everyone for moving right along in the successes and celebrations. As you can see, when you have a well-oiled machine in terms of routines, your students can continue to um, interact even when you're having tech difficulties. <coughs> Um, so let's take a look at a couple of these. Um, I had a chance to, to read some here. Um, let's see. Uh, Somebody gets to see their youngest grandchild next week for their birthday. Who is that? And um, what's uh, your grandchild's name? This is Lisa Hudson, and she's just turned a year two months ago. Her name is Alana. Aw, so sweet. And uh, who is that with um, a uh, chicken on their shoulder. Um, this looks exciting. What are you doing uh, with chickens? That's me. I'm Lori from Wisconsin, and that picture is of my daughter. So we've been working the last couple days putting together a larger 7x7 seven seven chicken coop. So she's going to put together a jungle gym inside for them for this winter so they have a little bit more fun than they did in their small coop. Ooh, very cool. I can see that she is uh, quite comfortable with them being so close to, to her. Yeah, she loves them. Oh, lovely. Um, and let's see, Mary Beth, tell us a little bit about yours. And um, while Mary Beth is speaking, uh, if you all will notice on slide five, we already have some interaction. We have a yellow arrow going over there, someone asking which college, and some back and forth. Um, but Mary Beth, go ahead. Yeah, so my daughter is getting ready for her first year um, of college. She's going to Sweetbriar College, which is an all-women's school in um, Central Virginia. And it's really a small school. It's 400 students and on a huge campus, 3,000 acres, and so plenty of area to social distance. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't realize it was that uh, that small, but um, in so much area. Seems like a fun math mm -hmm. problem to do there. Yeah. Uh, lovely. All right, folks, um, this is successes and celebrations. I do it every single time because it helps to build community. Um, I encourage you, if you want to continue to network with other people in this session and others, um, that you um, put on a Twitter handle or if you prefer to, to connect through email address. Um, some people make some strong bonds in these sessions, and so I encourage you to uh, connect with other people. That way you don't feel alone in this online learning experience and you feel a sense of connection. Um, alrighty, let's head down to our math routine. This is always, sometimes, never, and I've got the link uh, to the uh, website where um, I learned about it, and I tried to think about how this would look in an online space. So if you join me on slide nine, you'll see the first of these, and I have lots of little dots at the bottom for you to move up into one of four categories. And I did change this ever so slightly to include a fourth category called usually, 
because sometimes I find I've got such brilliant little kiddos that they will find any reason to never make it go in the always or the never category. They'll, you know, even if it's like, will the sun rise tomorrow? They'll say, well, you never know. So I put up a usually <laughs> section um, as meaning and always without, you know, these extraneous circumstances. Um, so if you would go ahead and move a dot into slide nine. And um, for today's activity, we're just gonna keep rolling down. So once you finish slide nine, you're gonna move to slide 10, 11, 12, and I'll see when people um, have finished on slide 15, and then we'll go up and we'll chat about some choice ones. We're going to take just one more minute. And again, if you are just joining us, here's the link to our slides. We are on slides 9 through 15. And um, I like to kind of give my students a little bit of a heads up of which ones we're going to talk about. Um, and so I've identified those in yellow. Um, and I'd like to start off on slide 14. There are two different opposing um, thoughts on this one. If there are more holidays in a month, I work less that month. If you're someone who wrote always, would you tell us why you selected that? And if you were someone who did never, would you tell us why? Go ahead and turn on your microphone and, and just let us know why you selected that one. Raha, go ahead. So I selected never because I'm a workaholic and I feel like I can't shut off my brain. So even if there are holidays, I feel like it's my time to catch up on things I have on my to-do list that's on the bottom. Oh, I see. And you know what? Sometimes I'm in that category too. So I might even move over my dot to there now that I've thought about it that way. Um, is there anyone who thought always who would like to share?
Hmm, well, I'm going to have you all think yeah, about things. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I was talking, but didn't realize my microphone wasn't on. <laughs> my name's Tashika. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I think I chose always um, by mistake, but um, since I have, I'm thinking for me as a teacher, the more holidays that we have in a month, I thought, I guess I would think about it in a sense, I'm not working in the building at, at work or uh, doing anything related. I try to turn off the work uh, from what we would have to do in the classroom oh, on lovely. those days. Wonderful. Yeah. So you're not in the building during those holidays. I'm thinking of December on that one or, you know, maybe yeah. even August, depending on, um, you know, the, the start time. Yeah, um, absolutely. Wonderful. Let's check out uh, slide number 12. Somebody, uh, actually many people said always on this one. Um, what's a reason that you think that if the area of a circle increases, the radius increases also? I was thinking that area equals pi r squared, so I was thinking it was related to the radius, so whatever is happening to, as the radius goes up, that area is going to go up. Wonderful, Lori. Um, and then that kind of relates to slide 10. Um, can someone tell us the relationship you see between that circle and then the square on slide 10? Did anyone make any connections um, between the circle and the square? Hi, Mary Beth, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was thinking the same thing. So if the area inside the square is increasing, the length would have to increase as well. So the square is, has equal, four equal lengths, and the area inside is increasing, the side length has to increase. Ah, oh, yes. Um, and then depending on whether you call that length or width, we have Raha thinking of, um, of it that way. Um, and some people are looking at, does only one side need to increase? And then we can get into the discussion about squares, like what's so special about squares? Um, and what's different between a rectangle? Um, so that's how we can use always, sometimes, and never. Um, I tried to put things in here that had a direct relationships, like when one thing goes up, the other thing goes up. Um, and um, uh, inverse uh, relationships where one goes up and one goes down. Um, and so uh, I see there's some connections coming in the chat box. Um, so that's a fun way that you can kind of introduce this activity with students, make some things low stakes. It is anonymous in terms of where you move your uh, dot. Um, and so some people will even move their dots as the discussion continues. Um, I did try to add a, a book in here for you all on slide 17. Um, it's called If You Hopped Like a Frog. And I, I can't remember if I posted this one recently in this session or with my grad students. I, you know, my days are mixing up right now. Um, but when you, in the book, If You Hopped Like a Frog, it's all about like a frog can hop so far in proportion to its size. And so if you were to hop like it, you'd be able to go all the way across the basketball um, court and make a dunk every time. So it really gets us to think in terms of proportional reasoning, which will kind of set us up for today's activity. Um, if you join me on slide 19, these are, slide 19 has the NCTM eight math teaching practices, and you will see all eight of these today. Um, the purpose of this is that we're seeing math differently and we're seeing math so that it's applicable in our world. And our problem solving oath is on slide 20. I'm going to read it out loud. I ask you to read it along with me. And if you pledge to do this oath today, to go ahead and type your name in the chat box. I, Teresa, promise to try my best. I will make sense of patterns and numbers. I will use manipulatives and drawings. I will make mistakes. I will ask questions. I will listen to other ideas. 
I will stay engaged by always trying to find another solution or representation. I am a problem solver. I make the world a better place. And I can see we have so many wonderful problem solvers who took the oath today. And you can join us on slide 21 for our problem. You might be familiar with an orange juice concentrate problem or an apple juice problem. Um, if you've seen this before, I tried to really change it up to get us to think about things quite differently today. Um, so this is the lemonade problem. Dimitri is trying to find the perfect lemonade for his lemonade stand. He uses a journal to log each unique recipe along with notes like too watery or too sweet or just right. He finally made a winning batch. The next day he opened his journal to repeat the recipe and noticed that some lemonade spilled on the journal. Help Dimitri figure out the missing information in his journal. To do this task, you have several manipulatives on slide 22. You don't need to feel um, that these are the only manipulatives. I just try to give ones that I think would be really appropriate um, for this problem, but feel free to use anything you like. I'm gonna set you up in breakout rooms and you'll have 20 minutes to work on this. I'll bring us all back at 1240. Remember to keep trying multiple things um, and um, keep working together. Alrighty, let me get groups. All right, our breakout rooms are starting now. Go ahead and turn on your microphone and say hello to your new teammates. Um, yes, I think we're group one. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's all of us. Yes, so I think we're on slide 24 for group two. Yeah. I'm an instructional coach in um, pre-K to five building in um, Iowa. Cool. Super. Good job. Oh, I see you in the notes. Okay, right. I, I got to read this. I, I don't know that. people are mixing up metric and... Um, So how might you use quiz and error odds to model this one? We're going to model the different ratios um, using the rods um, on the manipulative. So I haven't used this particular site before, so I'm trying to figure out. I'm still mm -hmm. playing around with it. Um, but essentially, to create like a pictorial model of like a table. Yeah.
to Lemony just... Hi there, group. I just wanted to check in, let you know that you're group seven. Um, so you have a workspace on slide 29 and you're welcome to add as oh. much more space as you need. Sorry, I didn't realize that and I copied and made a new slide for 33. So we're on oh, 33. Perfect. You know what? I'm just going to delete 30, uh, 29 so that um, we don't oh, see well. a blank one there. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. I'm glad you felt um, ownership of the slides that you could do that. And then we lost a couple people in our group, I think. But we might have more now. All right. Let's see. Okay, so two cups of sugar was too lemony. So the sugar looks the same in everything. So two cups of sugar is right. Oh, good. Thank you for making the chart. Excuse me, one of, one of the squares has four cups of sugar. Hmm. It will be consistent. Thank you. Okay. Sweet. There is a relationship. It's kind of a pattern in there. You can see a pattern or... So it should be for also columns. Oh, no, no, it's three. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's four, really. Like that or no? Um, yeah, but at the end, it said if it's perfect, we need to add the perfect, the two sweet. Okay. At the end, the four. So the result. Yeah. So that's the result, right? Yeah. Uh, then we need one more um, line, I believe. Color of the Unifix cube here would be one. I was thinking that I just clicked on the Unifix cube, and it, I think that would be fun because of that. Yeah. That could be yellow. Uh huh. Oh, yes, you're right. Okay. You guys are so far ahead of me. And can would we, we see each other doing different? something different in Google Slides? Or no? I only see, in fact, I only see my slide with the Unifix cube, so I don't know what we draw. Yeah, me too. Okay. How did we bring the Unifix cube down to the to the other slide. Hi folks, um, I just happened to be in your group when I heard the question. Um, for the Unifix cubes, if you're um, gonna be working in another tab, um, usually um, using a screenshot or a snag it, if you're familiar with either one of those, I can also walk you through the steps of how to do a screenshot if you need to, and then you can just paste a picture of your work on the slide. Oh, perfect, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> And I also noticed that Lydia in your group um, is uh, looks like going to try and play around with some of the numbers to see if um, she can find the missing ones. Um, so she also wrote up there in the chat. Um, I don't know, Lydia, if your microphone's not working, but um, that's a great way to communicate with your team. Yeah, she said that she's in India, so she may not have a microphone on her computer. Well, I know at my work, I don't have a microphone or... Um... Gotcha. Um, Lydia, yeah, feel free internet to... internet wasn't very good. Yeah, um, feel free to go ahead and um, try that out and communicate in the chat box um, as you guys are thinking about it. Okay, so now we 
don't know. Two cups. Colon, okay. So will we start with the sugar part? Perfect. It's two cups of sugar, four tablespoons of lemon, and then the relationship between water and everything else. Mm -hmm. Consistent among them all so that you can compare the other ingredients. Okay. Right, rather than like making guesses of what might be based on, because like, you know, I, like I teach middle school, so I can tell you middle schoolers are not very like regimented in there. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. so, uh, numbers to try. like, kids don't do that, right? So, um, mm -hmm. so if that wasn't consistent, then what could we make like the same so that we could compare them? Mm -hmm. I'm going to write X where we had to find a value so that I, <laughs> I didn't get confused. <laughs> That one was perfect. Hi there, group. I really like the explanation that you're writing in your table. Oh, thank you. And how did you decide on the numbers in blue? Uh, no. um, uh, well, in the top uh, right-hand corner, it has two liters of water, and then in the bottom left-hand corner, it had two liters of water. So we were thinking that that was the um, proportion, I guess. We're still working on it. <laughs> cool. I like how you use other information there. Someone else was going to say something? No. Um, I know that before you gave us some that are not proportional, and I struggle trying to do the wrong abstract. Oh, um, we'll continue on that um, that quest and see if you uh, can find a variety of ways of, of looking at it. Um, but it is neat that you all thought to keep the water as more of a constant, like maybe he has a two liter jug that he's filling up. Um, but as you continue thinking about it, um, it does the two liters need to be constant? Um, and so those are some different things to think about. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see, so two, two, Hi there, group five. Um, I just put Lisa back in your group. I believe this is the right space. Lisa, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Teresa. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope it's okay. I just started making a chart. That's what I did on my scratch paper. Um, and I agree with what you did on number three. We were missing watery. That's the first thing I went to. Oh, good. I'm glad someone else is filling it in because I feel like I need my glasses. And I said, like the water, too, I'm thinking, you know, it's, we've got two two things of two liters. And if you think about a pitcher, most of the pitchers are either two quarts or two liters. So I'm thinking the water could be two all the way across 
even though we don't know that. It would make sense to me. Like right here in this one, in the yeah. day one? Right. And I think the same. Watery? I'm wondering if this might be less, that's all. The perfect would be less water? Well, yeah, I'm just trying to... Yeah, that would make sense because if everything else is the same, like it's the same four teaspoons. I'm going to yeah, try and... That, no, that would make sense because it's it's it has to be something... It can't be the quantity of lemon, and it's not the quantity of sugar, because that's been determined in the other two. You're right. It could be water. I, I would buy that. All right. So for lemon, we have two cups. Looking at... So do we want to go ahead and say for perfect that we're proposing it could be one liter instead of two? Yeah, I'm just turning it on the units to see if that helps to visualize. Okay. I'm confused with it now. Please, sugar. Four sugar. Oh, we don't know that. Oh, we don't know. This one's two. Then you have four. This is three liters. Oh, somebody posted that. Good job. How'd you? Yeah, I think. I think it's making a picture. Wait, where's our? Yeah. Hi there, Grace. Wait. It looks like uh, you have finished your table um, in here. How do you think? How'd it go? And um. Well, we were kind of hypothesizing that if there's two lemony too sweet, there's three ingredients, then the lower left quadrant's got to be the third ingredient, that something happened to that. Cool. And um, uh, let's see. And you picked two watery for your other choice. Um, awesome. If you look at the three, if you see the three ingredients at the top, then that would be the third one that's, that's the one that's missing for that third, that lower left quadrant. Very cool. And then we thought that you had to have a consistent amount of water for all the other ones, except for the two, two lemony. So um, that's a really interesting assumption that you made there with the consistent amount of water. Um, and um, what, why did you choose to change that in the uh, two lemony situation? Because uh, we thought that if you had less water, that the lemon would overpower it. Right. So that, I, I don't know, the group, what do we think? Yeah. Less water and more lemon makes it taste too lemony. Right, because that one we were told it was too lemony. 
Lovely. Um, you do still have about two more, maybe more and more minute left if you all want to continue to think about your problem um, and figure out ways to rationalize why you know each of those are correct. Um, I am going to come to your group to have you share out um, how you chose the numbers. Um, so if you want to practice what you're going to say and decide on the speaker, that would be fantastic. Oh, uh, well, okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the main room. Can you believe you've already been working on it for 20 minutes? Um, and it is very clear to me that um, many groups could use additional time on this. Um, given our one hour uh, time, I'm going to um, describe how I would use the five practices in the discussion, um, you know, even in kind of that shortened time limit, because I know that's a common concern for teachers is how do I do rich tasks if everyone doesn't all finish at the same time. Um, and so hopefully I'm, I'm able to showcase that uh, here today. Um, and I've selected some of them down beginning on slide 35. Um, and we'll kind of go through this order here. Um, above slide 35, if you're not familiar with the five practices, um, this is um, uh, Smith and Stein's book about kind of the procedures for how you incorporate um, a discussion with a lot of discourse and connections. Um, and it first involves anticipating lots of solutions, which I was up last night kind of coming up with so many more than the initial one. Um, monitoring, going through and seeing what people are doing and asking questions during that monitoring stage. I've selected just a couple and I've sequenced them in a certain order um, below. And um, now during the discussion, I'm hoping to connect these um, between each other. Um, on slide 35, that's our first one, slide 35. Um, this group started the way many groups started. Um, and as you all were putting together your table, how did you have, what conversations did you have about columns and rows and how many columns and rows to have? Can someone from group eight tell us a little bit about your conversation? Uh, we got the idea of putting in order the list of, of ingredients, so that's why uh, one of the you know the participants said uh, let's 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 create a chart. So she did it uh, just to have you know in order the ingredients, and then yeah, having in order we were figuring out and using you know um, our math skills to figure it out how will be that the perfect lemonade. Lovely. Um, and some of the conversations that I was able to listen to in the different groups are um, some people started off with just three columns, sugar, lemon, uh, and water. And then they came up with a fourth. And, um, you know, some of them, so your tables kind of changed and developed as you continued. Um, a really neat table is down on slide 36. Come down and see that. Um, and specifically those two blue boxes. 
Can someone from group two tell us what you were thinking in terms of those two blue boxes and how you noted it um, on your slide? Well, um, the group member who did that, her mic isn't working today, um, but I know we had talked about how um, the kids would maybe start talking about how they noticed that on the first trial it was too lemony, and by the third trial um, they had reduced the amount of lemon. So we figured that they would, maybe on the second trial, they would do something less than they did on the first trial, but maybe more than they did on the second trial, I believe is, um, I mean, excuse me, more than they did on the third trial. And I believe that's kind of the thought process that Lydia had. I don't want to speak for her, but she can't speak at this point. <laughs> Dana, thank you for um, filling in the gaps there. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so Lydia's thinking here with the inequalities um, gives us a, a place to start to kind of guess and check. Like, let's plug some numbers in. We know the bounds of these. Um, and slide 37, we have some um, solutions here. And I'm curious, group four, how did you get these solutions? And did you use any of the methods from above, slide 35 or 36? Um, I think we just start, we started sort of reasoning and rationalizing what these ratios would look like and what the results were. So if it was, you know, too lemony, we knew that it probably had less water, you know, more lemon than and less water than, um, than the two liters. And if it was uh, too watery, it probably had a little less sugar. So we kind of try to keep equivalent ratios going um, using, and we also talked about that the size of the container probably didn't change, so it couldn't be any more than two liters. Oh. Mm -hmm. So we've got this kind of constant amount of water happening here. Um, and um, But then in the top one, can you explain to us why this water um, had changed? Anybody? Um, so we, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Naomi, you go. Go ahead. Well, we were thinking that um, for you, if you kept it at the two liters, then the lemony taste wouldn't be maybe as strong, but if you had less water and more lemon, it would make it taste too lemony. But now, I guess now I'm thinking about it, since in this case, I might revise my thinking because you have more lemon than in any of the other ones. So automatically, even if it was liters, it would still taste more lemony. Yeah, that's ah. true. So maybe you could keep water constant, but if you decrease water to just like one tablespoon, it would definitely be too lemony. Um, so there is yeah. this range, there is this kind of inequality happening. Um, and we could go back up to slide 36 to see um, their inequality that they selected there also, um, and maybe even kind of revise that. Um, it does sound like this idea of guess and check or guess and check with a rationale is really a very purposeful strategy um, to think about in, uh, in solving these. There is a slightly different strategy that several groups took on slide 38. Come on down to slide 38 and just take a moment to see if you can make sense of their different models. Try to guess what it is that you think each color means and what they're thinking.
All right, let's start with our uh, first one here. How does um, this model relate to our recipes? Um, whoever did this, can you tell us a little bit about your model? So Monica, you mentioned the colors represent sugar, uh, lemon, and water. Um, can you tell us how you see it related to the four recipes? Well, um, yeah, I'm looking at it. I can definitely, but I don't think they're the same in all the models, so that's what's a little hard. I love how the one in the upper right-hand corner said blue was water, red was sugar, and yellow and um, yellow was lemon. Um, I'm trying to figure it out in the other one. I'm, uh, but, oh, there's one. Like the, the white is the sugar, and then the lemon is yellow in that top one. So then the blue must stand for the water, which is kind of cool. So they're trying to see it, the parts with the whole using those um, blocks. That's what I say. So that's what I'm trying to see in all the charts, and that's how I'm trying to make sense of it. Absolutely. So we've got this idea of sugar, lemon, and water, but um, is anyone else a little bit annoyed that the towers, whether they are horizontal towers or vertical towers, aren't all the same length? Is that bothering anyone at all? <laughs> I was trying to talk about like how we're trying to find the perfect whole. So like if I'm thinking of it as a fraction, like all my pieces have to make one whole. And if I'm thinking about a jug of lemonade, I'm going to make the same jug of lemonade, which is my liquid whole. And yes, it's bothering me. <laughs> Long explanation. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, e you know, each time we could make water the same um, if it's the same jug. And having one constant can make these um, different variables a lot more manageable. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be constant here. Um, you know, maybe he just made a small little cup to see how it tastes versus a whole entire jug. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about here is units. Some of these were in cups, some of them were in tablespoons, and some of them were in liters. But in these models, um, every um, different thing had the same size, like one cube. Um, how do we discuss um, units in terms of the models here? Uh, Tanya, go ahead. Um, when I was looking at this, I'm the one that created the one that's above the arrow. I was just looking at data and I was like, how can I represent the data to make sense and notice trends? And so I just did the simple one, one, but I noticed that, you know, this is what I knew about the first three tri trials. And then I noticed there was a constant with two that he didn't, you know, say was bad. So I assumed that two would be the perfect number for water, but I noticed that he halved the other, you know, things. So then I thought, looking at looking at the pattern of halves, then I can make a prediction of the last one. So I didn't necessarily need to know units. I was more looking at the data, kind of visually representing visually representing it. Ah, uh, and so um, Tanya, when you visually represented this one over here, this red, yellow, blue, it appears yes. to me that there is more yellow in the jug than anything else. Is that the case? Yeah, because on his third trial, he had said, use four teaspoons of lemon. And I'm assuming that minute was too watery. Um, and then he, I'm assuming he halved, he had eight teaspoons of lemon juice and he halved it. And tr I'm assuming he did four for on the second trial and he said it was too sweet, but didn't mention anything about lemon. So then I, again, I was using what I assumed on that to figure out the perfect model. So I'd like everyone else to kind of think about this and put it in the chat box. Both of the pink arrows show a large amount of lemon. 
does that mean that the container contains mostly lemon? Um, and um, how do you see units play out in this? Feel free to write in the chat box. We'll hear from Michelle also. And if you want to comment um, out loud, go ahead and raise your hand. Go ahead, Michelle. So I had actually started similarly trying to use the Cuisinaire rods to model this. But I think what's unique about this from a problem where maybe you were mixing together like orange juice concentrate in water or something like that is that the sugar is dissolving into the water, the lemon is, you know, like absorbing it or whatever. So like the actual volume amount is not, you know, if you have five cubes, it's not that there's like a volume of five, it's just trying to show the ratios. Um, and then, yes, I I liked the, the Cuisinaire rod at first because I was like, oh, it's really obvious to see that that's too lemony, except there isn't actually more lemon. There's the least amount lemon of everything in the jug um, in that example there. Oh, so there's the least amount of lemon, although it appears in the model the most. Um, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit more about what you wrote in the chat there? Uh, yes. So I was trying to figure out how I could properly compare the elements related to the volume. And it occurred to me that, you know, one cup um, is equal to 16 tablespoons. So I would need to, to correctly compare like the proportions of those um, elements. I would really need to convert them all to either cups or tablespoons. So when we think about how many tablespoons are actually in a cup, this model that shows lemon being like the most, um, the, the biggest amount in the jug doesn't really hold true. Now I'm going to flip it. This model is absolutely correct, and we can use these models to compare, um, and we don't need to convert units. Why is that? Um, Janine, I see that you wrote in there about younger students, and actually younger students usually have an easier job with this problem than older students. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you think that they wouldn't need the conversions? I, I teach younger kids, and I am also a very, personally, a very concrete and visual learner. So when I was going through, I would, it was more just to help me with the colors of if there were four yellows, that just meant four tablespoons. Um, and then that way you can see from recipe to recipe kind of what changes and what stayed the same so that you can finally figure out the perfect recipe. So I was just thinking of it definitely more of a visual concrete thing instead of actually a conversion for younger kids. Neat. Yeah, so with, with younger kids, or even if you don't need to think about it, the lemon juice, because it uses the same t um, unit in each of them, um, we, don't, we don't need to convert anything because we can still compare between them. Um, yeah. The uh, sugar, because it's always in cups, um, we don't need to convert that into liters or anything because all the sugar in every recipe is constant. Use the same uh, unit. So while this doesn't show the proportional amounts, we can use these models in reference to other amounts. And one fun thing about um, using um, the digital learning um, is that we can stretch and shrink models where we can't do that um, with our Cuisinaire rods in the classroom. And this is what I mean by stretching and shrinking our models. Um, I've just made a duplicate copy of it um, and I can line it up next to it and I can stretch this till the red is about the same as the yellow and get more of a proportional understanding of which one has more red. Um, so we can, we can play around with units, we can play around with proportions, and we can play around with different um, images to help us understand the problem. Um, we have one more to take a peek at, slide 39. Um, specifically look at the arrows and what is said about those arrows. Um, 
Um, and with the group that did this, just explain kind of your thinking with the eras and how that helped you to solve the problem. Sure, this is also from group four. Sorry, we didn't put it on the slide. Um, but having the number lines lets you see um, different quantities. So for example, I started by looking at the perfect recipe where there were two cups of sugar for four cups of lemon juice. And then if you follow the green arrow to compare it to the one that's too lemony, you see, again, that for two cups of sugar, there's twice as much lemon juice or eight tablespoons of lemon juice. So it kind of let me reason back and forth between some of the different quantities that we were working with and um, keep following those ratios. Because with the Unifix cubes, my brain got a little confused about tablespoons and cups and liters all being the same size. Lovely. And so now that we have the idea of this number line, again, our units don't really matter because they all have the same tablespoons for lemon. Um, but um, the way that a tablespoon is lined up next to a cup um, kind of gives a little uh, bit of different clarity in terms of the number line. Um, I suspect that many of us are still going to continue to think about this problem, and that is perfectly okay. When I do um, sessions, even with students, and we didn't have enough time to finish, sometimes I give more time to finish. Sometimes I say, hey, this is where we are right now. Let's have our discussion. And I think in our discussion, we still brought up ideas about proportionality, the um, ideas about conversions, and how you can use guess and check models or um, other visual models to start to think about your rationale of why why something should be larger or smaller. And those were the key components that I would be talking about all unit long. Um, alrighty, I encourage you on slide 41, if you see a connection to a grade level and a particular uh, topic that you put it in here, it's always nice to see ways that we can take a problem and tweak it for a different grade level. Um, so if you would like to go ahead and, and give us feedback there, I invite you to do so. Slide 43 is a reminder that all of my templates are available. This one will be up uh, shortly. I've recorded it and I'll be posting that um, on my website. And I'll stay after for anyone else who wants to chat um, in the virtual parking lot. You can feel free to put your questions on slide 44 or 45 and I will answer every single one of them. Um, if you are not planning to stay for the question answer session, that's just fine. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Saturday and happy Mather days. Alrighty, um, I'm going to start on slide 44. Um, how do you look at each group's work using the tabs and talk to them at the same time? Um, so what I do, let me share my screen. Um, as I'm going through the session, I'm constantly doing this. You can see that my slides are moving up and down. I'm looking for new things, um, highlighted things, way that, ways that things have changed. Um, and at the same time, I'm clicking into the different groups in the breakout rooms. Um, I can show you an example of breakout rooms uh, right here. So on my website, I have a lot of video tips because I get many of the same questions. Um, this is everything. Okay, so I'm gonna link your question to a video that talks all about breakout rooms. So if you wanna watch that uh, video, you can feel free to click on that. Can you post the slow reveal graphs? You know, I, I did, but it's coming up really funky. Let me know if you can see this. And today I should be able to have some time. Oh, let's be honest, tomorrow I'll have more time. Um, it's only showing up like on the side. I got to figure out my web page skills here. Um, but it should have the problem and the completed slides and the recording there. Um, the recording's also on my YouTube channel. And um, I'll go ahead and just post that so you have access to it. Hello. There you go. What's a good video to watch to make the dots and always sometimes never slides? I've tried doing emojis and have troubles making the emojis copied. Um, yes, so that's kind of like how to clone things. And um, 
I made a video on that. Alright, so there's a video on how to clone things. Um, I just cloned the dots and um, put them in there. How do you have each group click on their group number and then go to a copy of the Google slide where they aren't working on the Google slide you sent out? Oh, um, that is like in Math Workshop. Um, so what I've done for that is I've created um, several uh, documents. Um, let me see. Um, so I have a file in my Google um, Drive that starts with the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way down to 21. And these are um, duplicate copies of slides for the math workshop. Um, and so um, I just create copies of these. And uh, you can just link them in. So if I wanted you to go the bottom half to link to one of these, um, I would get a shareable link and paste it in. And I just um, make like 20 different links. So the truth of the matter is that's a lot of work but I only do it one time. I have my link page and I use it every time I do Math Workshop. I just um, update the slides in here. Um, did they screenshot the manipulatives onto the slides? Yes. Um, if you need uh, support doing screenshots, um, you can Google this term um, and it will show you how to do it on Chromebooks, Macs, PCs. Um, for um, PCs, it's the window button and print screen. Um, for Macs, I believe it's Command 5. You guys can let me know if I'm wrong. I'm not a Mac user most of the time. Uh, in Chromebook, there's a designated button on your top toolbar uh, for screen captures. How do you create the arrow? Um, it's right here in Shapes. I just grab this arrow here, and there's lots of fun ones. I sometimes use this to kind of put directions um, along with it. And sometimes I'll change the color, but it's just a shape and it's found up in the uh, the shapes button right here. Um, what do I use to record the session? I use Camtasia. Um, I um, use this because I'm trying to get an hour long session recorded. I like to go through and edit it. I like to take out, um, sometimes there's private information that people really don't want shared on there. So I'll like take out that little snippet of information, um, things like that. But Camtasia is an editing software. It lets you add music and other things to it. Um, but it is a software that you would buy. So you can check with your um, tech at your school and they might have access to it. They um, might get it for you or they might suggest other things like Screencastify. Um, how do you set up the breakout groups? Here's a link to do that. Um, how do you make anonymous participants in groups? Um, that's the way that I share my Google Slides. Since um, I'm working with so many people, um, it is just easier for me to send out a link to everybody that's anonymous. However, I do not recommend you do anonymous with your students um, uh, unless you have certain um, norms and procedures uh, in place because when you share the link, so I go up to share, um, and I would share this link. If other kids copy and paste that link onto, let's say, Twitter, and their friends or people they don't even know click it, now you have strangers in your class. Um, so in, for in, in um, thinking about security, you probably want to um, go ahead and share via the student email address, the school ID number, or through Google Classroom, um, and that video will let you know how to do it. 
I'm going to head down to slide 45. Um, what are your go-to resources for different um, Math or Days problems? Oh gosh, um, honestly, um, I make up a lot of them. Uh, some of them I do use from other sources and I um, try to cite those sources. Um, but oftentimes I just think all week about, you know, hey, what's a problem worth solving or what's a problem that is pretty good but I can make better by deleting out other materials? However, that being said, I will tell you my new favorite book that is filled with problems. Let me, um, the social justice in high school, um, teaching math for social justice. Mm, that's not it. Um, Why isn't this coming up? Let me just go get my actual book and I can uh, copy the citation. Uh, high School Mathematics Lessons to Explore Social Injustice. There we go. There we are. This is my new favorite book. Um, it is filled with tons and tons of amazing um, actual lessons. Now it is geared for high school. Um, so I just take those and I break them down for um, younger kiddos. Um, so that's a resource. And let me see. There's another resource that I used to love. It's still a great book. I just um, I haven't used it as much recently. Um, rich and engaging math tasks. This one is for grades five through nine. Um, and I find this one pretty useful um, also in kind of thinking about um, tasks. And I'm just gonna move this other question out of the way. Um, so those are um, some pretty um, useful books in figuring out your tasks. Um, where do you post the slideshows that you use during the PD sessions? Um, right here on the Math or Days link. Um, on there you can see all of the past uh, problems including blank slide templates, um, the completed slides, and the PD recording. It'll take you right there. Um, and there's something going on with this. I'll try and get this fixed probably by tomorrow. I have a draft of uh, a book that I'm writing uh, due today. So um, I'm probably not going to get to it today, but I will get to it tomorrow and just fix this up. But this is where it's at. Um, one of my classes, kids accidentally deleted some content. Do you ever... Um, do you know how to go back to recover content? So a couple things. Um, I would recommend, um, if you are interested in learning more about that, um, to watch the video or uh, come to the session on classroom management and accountability, uh, where we kind of go over more of these details here. Um, um, but typically what I do um, you'll see my slide right here on the shared screen. Throughout the lesson, when I want to keep things, I uh, do make a copy of the entire presentation. My naming convention is just to put the time at the end, so 113. It's really quick for me to write in. Um, and I have another slideshow in the background. There are ways that you can do this version history. Um, and if you're interested, I recommend uh, checking it out. I don't love it though. I think it's way easier for me to make copies, have them hang out in the background. That way, if someone deletes something, I can just copy it and, and pop it right in. Um, and so it's that's the way I choose to do it. Um, but you can check out version history also. Um, Someone said, how can the material we cover be linked to standards? 
Um, so here on the vertical stretch, um, you saw several people who are um, relating them to standards. What I find is rich tasks are related to many standards. Um, I like to use a rich task at the beginning of each unit so that when we're talking about direct variation, for example, um, I don't just have to say, remember the definition for direct variation. As one goes up, the other one goes up. Instead, I can say, hey, do you guys remember in the um, problem with the lemonade, um, if it was too watery, what did we have to increase? And you know, they would say the water. And so it gives us a context to talk about. Um, as we're talking about um, um, uh, proportions, um, I might say, you know, if this one only has one liter of water and four tables of tablespoons of lemon what do we have to do if i'm going to make it two table uh, two tablespoons of lemon what happens to the water um, and so it gives students a context to care about um, and then you can link those contexts um, to your standards all right folks i think i've gotten to all of these questions but if you have others feel free to turn on your mic i'm happy to take other questions and otherwise happy math or days Do you have any recommendations of, of books for younger students for rich tasks? Um, let me think for a minute. Um, I wonder in their five practices book if they have tasks in here. Because um, so I need to look a little bit more in detail. I can see that they definitely have some tasks in here. I would check out um, the new five practices book. Here it is. I can already see that there's a bunch of tasks in here. I haven't had a chance to really unpack it yet. Um, I just posted that link in with the other book uh, links. And there's five practices in practice for every grade level. And just thumbing through it, I can see several different tasks are in here. And they also say there's 65 plus minutes of online video that I'm excited to check out also. All right, folks. Well, happy Mather Days.